Um, there was an agenda that was. Oh, up. I'm not on video. I don't. This one doesn't start video automatically. There you on video now. So here's the link to the to the Google Doc. Bingo. Um, so um, I guess we can just kind of start working our way through this for the monthly call, right? So. Um, as we kind of go through uh, working group updates, we can just start there. Um, and I can start taking notes here. So Don, do you have updates from Common? You're muted. Yeah, yeah, sorry. No, I have to go back to the minutes to remember what we what we talked about, because I Okay, I then I'll, I'll put you on hold. Thanks. Um, DNI? Don, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, Georg, I think you were in the last DNI. Do you want to give updates as to what's going on there? You're muted too, Georg. He knows. All right, I will I'm, also I'm put. I'm looking you. for my. Okay, I can I can go on common while he gets the okay. gets his notes set up. So um, so we did a few things in the the last meeting, which was on February twentieth. Uh, we looked at the verse, diverse contributions metric. So we um, made some good progress on that one. And then we actually revised all of the descriptions for our focus areas because right. we realized we had gotten to a point where we had, um, you know, who, what, when, and where uh, as our focus areas. And then we didn't actually have clear consensus on what each of those meant and what to put in those categories. So we put um, much more clear descriptions around each of those focus areas so that we at least have a goal statement that it now I think is hopefully clear on what that uh, what that means. And that's the common common update. Okay. The next meeting is uh, March 5th this Thursday. Mm -hmm. And I've got that one. Yeah, good, because I, I might be on a plane. I don't know. Yeah, who, knows? who knows? You don't even worry about it. So. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, Georg with DNI. So, diversity inclusion working group has met twice since ChaosCon. Um, there are one big topic that we talk about is the diversity inclusion badging for events that Matt Snell is working on with Sale. So, there's some progress happening in figuring out how we're going to work on this. The second topic that we discussed was a metric toolkit. Emma Irvin proposed this on an issue to have a uh, easy to use toolkit for how to start implementing metrics. So taking the metrics we have defined and boiling it down into actionable steps. And then the third and last thing we did is a we worked on the documentation accessibility metric and advanced that. It's a metric we've been working on for a while now and so we revised it last week. Okay. Um, and if you, the, can you talk a little bit about the metrics toolkit? So there's a, a link. I think this is kind of where Emma's head is. I put a link in here. Do you see that toolkit link that I put in the minutes? I'll put it here as well. So I think the toolkit that anybody could correct me if I'm wrong, but the toolkit that I'm understanding is trying to create ways that people can come to understand the DNI work through just a series of fairly simple steps. And you start defining like this activity will take a half a day or this activity will take a day um, or 30 minutes. Um, and here are the, the simple things. And this is, if, as you see, like a, you need a paper and a pen. This is for one to three people. The difficulty is low. 
I think it was a really interesting idea, not just for maybe approaching metrics, but even like the software that's part of chaos. I say these so, don't look particular. They don't. These don't look like narrowly focused on DNI. These look like things I might want to do anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, no, these are no. These aren't DNI. These are just examples that she was okay. bringing forward. This was a kind of a toolkit approach that was being used, I, maybe by Emma or just at Mozilla. Yeah, so this you is you have to take a look at this kind of this structure right. and think about how. This is literally going in my course materials for my lecture on human computer interaction today. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm glad you could. I'm glad this is that. immediate benefit. This is great stuff. Wow. So it's just ways to approach the work that I think is being done in chaos in kind of more bite size ways. Well, they're methods. They're they're practices you can follow to get to ends that we seek in many of the different things that we're doing. So, and I think. And I think the idea is to have similar things just for metrics. So replace the heading where it says mm. uh, jobs to be done, and we call this the contributor diversity. And then the purpose is our description. The outcome is where we describe what you will have afterwards. We have the small description of how much work we think it'll be, what tools you will need. And then detailed steps we describe. How do you get contributor diversity? Um, I'm looking at these, and I think I've done every one but mobile moments over my career. So, so I think I think another approach might be to say these are really good strategies for drawing out ideas in different ways, and what are some questions or framings for applying these strategies to DNI? So let's like, like instead of writing our own leverage. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't think that's the total approach that she's trying to bring forward. Okay. Um, Maybe tell me that. Yeah. So I think it's as Georg was pointing out that like jobs to be done would be like approaching a particular metric in mm -hmm. DNI. Mm -hmm. So it's less about kind of formulating what the metrics can be, and it's more about thinking about the metrics that have been put forward and how you as a person can become engaged with that metric or apply that metric in your own in your own work. Uh, so it's end user training for metrics. So kind of it's describing the the metrics as methods. So taking this format that this toolkit has, but just using it as a template and creating methods for each metric so that we can describe step-by-step step how you actually go about collecting each method. So, so throw out the methods that are here. We are not doing jobs to be done. We are not doing a quick market research. We are not doing quick competitive review. Those are in the toolkit. That's not what we're doing. We're just using this format for um showing how we can collect metrics okay okay so and, and it's is it showing how we can collect metrics or is it showing how you might apply this metric inside your project i'm just trying to get a handle on the scope so why don't i'm gonna m move on so this is part All of it right. yep as we have this is kind of going on in the dni working group right now and okay so that's meeting tomorrow at 10 us central so i mean if you i think we can talk about it there okay a little bit more detail just looking at the list of things we have to get through so um evolution working group or any updates in that regard they have been working i missed the last meeting because of a meeting another meeting i was at yeah and um so i don't know my understanding is that they are large that uh, they're largely working through developing metrics for the next release Okay. That the and that is all visible on the spreadsheet of of shared love. Sure. Okay. Pull that up. Okay. Um, risk. Same. Same bat time. Same bat channel. We had a. 
We had what I think is an interesting discussion. There's three metrics that we're actively working on developing. And there's one, uh, I wouldn't call it a metric, although I think we're going to frame it as that because that's what we do, which is uh, accumulating and mapping the freeform tags that exist on GitHub issue repositories in, into some kind of bag of words where the 50 words for bugs or 50 words for snow to quote a Kate Bush album that exist on GitHub or GitLab get mapped into sort of a, a single category. So if I wanted to look at a thousand GitHub repositories that all have their own tagging systems because they're from 40 organizations, um, this bag of words would give us a, a map to understand pretend probabilistically similar things. Um, sort of overcoming some of the free, free formedness um, that GitHub's uh, issue tracker ease of use created over things like Bugzilla and making the data more tractable for, for all tools. Okay. Um, cool. And yeah, that's the, that's I think the most novel thing we're doing other than grinding through metrics. Okay. Um, and I think the intention is to create a metric out of that discussion, right? This bag of words. Yeah. So the, so the, it's interesting though, I have to figure out how to frame it as a metric, but yes, it would be a, a metric for a uh, percentage of issues classified according to some taxonomy from the literature and also potentially from our experience. Okay. And then if you find a word that's not in the bag, pull request, add the word to the bag. Gotcha. Um, cool. Moving on. Uh, Georg, have you been in value lately? I want to say I have been, <laughs> but I, I also recognize that we have virtually, literally, figuratively not met. Okay, so no update at the moment? No update. Okay. The only update is that we moved the time to the same time as the common working group, yep. just on the off week. That was the only change we made. Okay. So, and has been pointed out, there are officially now no chaos meetings on Fridays. <laughs> so, so, the small things that matter. <laughs> that's, that's certainly oh, one of them. So did value even value move from Friday then? Yeah, it's on Thursdays now at the opposite time of, so on the two week off times that common is, that makes sense. So it's a 10 a.m. U.S. Central on the weeks that Common isn't meeting. Oh, okay. There it is. It showed up on my calendar. Okay. Um, software updates. Let's. I'm going to start with Grimoire Lab. So either Daniel or Santi, things that have been just anything you want to bring forward that's interesting that you might want us to know about. So. I would say there are, there are a couple of things of certain interest. The first one is the discussion about uh, migrating to GitLab that yeah. we just had. And we can open the conversation now if you want to everyone to chaos. And the second one probably Sandy can help a bit more than me, which is very last advances in Grimoire Lab in the last week, couple of weeks. So Sandy, all yours. Yeah, we have a, a new release. We, I, th I think we released it uh, last Friday, and uh, basically it, it fixes some bugs and it adds some new panels to the, to the, to the stack. So not much, not big, not big changes, but useful changes. Okay. Are there any changes in particular you want to talk about or just mostly yeah let me it. check i just looking okay. for a change log because okay. i have somewhere here <laughs> and yeah, sorry Ma, i messed a bit with the index but you were writing <laughs> i'm doing my best it, it happened that suddenly everything got updated so i was like oops <laughs> I <did something> wrong. <laughs> trying to take notes and and talk i'm getting pretty good at it <laughs> So what probably the most important change, change is that it's possible to 
to edit information uh, regarding organizations using the uh, uh, hashtag, which is the web interface to uh, sorry, uh, yeah, the web, web interface to manage uh, information about identities and organizations and affiliation. So uh, that's probably, it's a small change, but it's very useful change. Is it that the organizations themselves can manage their identity? Yeah, those ones. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we also, uh, let me check, let me check it here. We include the, I think we worked on this uh, a few weeks ago in the Grimoire Lab call, which mm -hmm. was to to create an overview panel showing the soft contributions and hard contributions. I think we did it two weeks ago, maybe, Danny? I think you were there, Matt. Yeah, I was there. It was a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so we include that panel in the in the in the stack, so it's, they can find that that information. The, well, the user will have the 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 new overview panel instead of the Great. old one. Great. And I, and I think those those are the most important things. Okay. Great. Thanks, Santi. You're welcome. Um, and then, uh, Daniel, we'll hold off on the GitLab GitHub thing because it's on the list below. So, um, Sean, Auger? Auger is continuing to um, develop and we're collecting more repositories for more people all the time. Our Docker container is available in our dev branch and ready to go. The only thing we're waiting to test to release it uh, is the UI that we built so that you can just take a list of um, repos from anywhere and add them automatically into Augur. Um, we're going to make that available inside the Docker container. Say that a new UI for that. Uh, yeah, so basically you can uh, copy and paste any number of uh, URLs for Git repositories into it. It'll clean them up, uh, put them in a list, uh, let you put them in groups, and um, then run your own collection on whatever those repositories are. Um, we're only going to release it in the Docker. Uh, we're going to release it, but only have it build under the Docker build right now because there is no uh, SSO behind Docker okay. at this point. So you would not want to put that onto your public website. Um, we do have a parallel project taking place right now where we're using um, Glue and Hyperledger Indie to create a um, SSO that's on the blockchain for use you're, of Augur. You're doing that or you're talking about it? We're physically, yeah, we're doing it. I've installed Hyperledger Indie and I've got a developer who I will talk to this week about the glue part, but Don, Don Marty and I have kind of sketched out how we're gonna, gonna do that piece of it. And that, that'll, I think, be a useful piece of software probably existing outside of the Augur repository in a separate repo that, that would let anyone who wants to make their metrics public uh, uh, be able to see it. I think it also pilots the necessary infrastructure for dealing with what I think is the inevitable decision at some point down the road where email addresses are no longer going to be part of your Git log. Um, and when that happens, uh, we need, we'll need we need to be ready with some kind of substitute for really anything that we're doing to continue to be all that it is. Um, I didn't really follow that last statement. That was um, of yeah, well, I mean, it's, <laughs> at, at some point when there's, when GDPR starts looking at Git logs and doesn't yeah. exempt them, um, we're, we're gonna have, they're gonna have to be taken out at some point in, in the future from yeah. the Git log. Um, the inertia of privacy in our society, in all societies, seems to be um, driving us in that direction. I gotcha. Okay. And it's probably two or three years down the road, but I called it preemptively addressing GDP. It's pilot, like it's a very early pilot. Like we don't look at it as being on the roadmap for Augur this year. We look at it being something we need to understand this year. All right. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Anything else from Augur? Um, our our uh, Slack our Slack thing does work, but I'm working on the configuration. So, but right now it's like uh, 
if anyone's ever used enterprise automation tools like BMC Patrol or Tivoli, um, you'll recognize that the first thing you get when you install one are just hundreds and hundreds of dings that things are broken. So we're working on letting it be both self-tuning and uh, user tunable so that it doesn't become a spam bot okay. for someone who plugs it in. That's, gotcha. yeah, I won't release it until it's not a spam bot, which okay. right, right now it is. <laughs> <laughs> I still call it a Slack bot, but I yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. That sounds it's way sexier to call it that yeah. than okay. spam bot. Um, all right, so good. Thank you, uh, working groups, and thank you, software. Um, in terms of moving down, I'm kind of in the middle here on recent discussions. So, um, so congrats. I don't know that we've had the official call, or maybe it was last week, but as you all know, we're part of Google Summer of Code and Outreachy which is pretty awesome. So I'm really excited about both of those. Um, I was thinking about Google Summer of Code. You know, last year, if I recall, we had four interns, is that right? How many did Yes, you we had four. There were two GSOC students in Grimoire Lab and two on Augur. And uh, it was, I think, I think both of us experienced uh, really high quality yeah. contributions from those interest? students. I mean, based, I know it's a little hard to say now, but I mean, I, mean, I, I responded to over 40 comments on our GSOC issue, which is significantly higher than the volume we faced last year. So, okay. And um, I'm getting emails from people that I'm redirecting to the issue because I can't respond to all those emails. So would, from an Augur perspective or from a Grimoire Lab perspective, I mean, would you be interested in more than two students i'm trying to ask like from a capacity perspective because all i remember is last year we kind of picked four arbitrarily mm -hmm. and then i think we submitted a request for four students and it was approved like in five seconds and i saw a number of other projects had more than four students so or mentees um so i could i can support comfortably five whoa oh. All right. Um, I mean, I think if I get over that, then it's just um, like the management overhead on two it yeah. was was significant. But I had uh, I had our, my, my most experienced auger people full time on it last summer. So, I have so I think I think just okay. as a practical matter, I can't manage more than five well. Um, what about from a more lab perspective? I mean, you don't have to commit to a number. I'm just it, it is more than two even on the radar from a Grimoire Lab perspective. So in, in our case, I think we can only manage two. Okay. Mo That's cool. The most, it will be three, right? So because okay. it's, and it's we, are busy, we are busy with other stuff. And now, they, they, as, as Sean was saying, that the, there's more activity than, than the last year. OK. Uh, many people writing and many people trying to do things. So now it's, it's getting, we are getting a stress. With this, I, 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 one thing I would say with my five number is if there are, if there are shared things for the chaos community that can be framed as, uh, uh, GSOC projects that would serve Augur and Grimoire Lab. So if there's things that we both want to do, um, and I think we both use Python pretty heavily, but if there's so if there's things we both want to do, um. I'm, I'm open to saying if I can if I can manage five, have one or two of those be on shared projects that and we'd have to define those. But if, if those exist and I, I know less about Grimoire Lab than Augur, but some of the things in common seem like they might be challenges that could be addressed at, at a community level and incorporated into both pieces of software. Um, okay. I'm, I'm willing to consider that. Um, so then this leads to kind of the other, with respect to Outreachy, you know, we have a number of projects, proposed projects that are kind of Augur focused, some that are um, uh, Grimoire Lab focused. And so we may want to think about how we go about identifying that student, because that's just going to be a single student. We also have projects that, I think there's one from the value working group, and I know that there's also one from, uh, with respect to DNI badging. So we may want to think about as the students express interest in the projects, that's kind of the first thing that has to be identified, right? Um, and then how we go about kind of 
um, allocating the resources to that mentee. We haven't really talked about that, right? So if we have, I mean, the reality is, is if we have five people interested in outreachy projects, we have to come come to a way to identify, we only have one, we only have enough resources for a single individual. So it doesn't have to be solved now. It's just something that I wanna put out there. Um, outreachy has a, a, it's a, it's a finite thing, right? It's a, so just one person. Um, so it's a finite issue that we have to kind of consider to move forward. Um, so if anybody has thoughts on that, you can speak up, but we can also just leave that for on your, on your radar. Um, with respect to, to the next issue, which is GitHub and, and GitLab. So um, I think Daniel had pointed out that we had just spent kind of the prior meeting, the Grimoire Lab meeting, talking about this. And it was really, it was a, I thought it was a really great, great discussion. Um, so from my understanding, there are a couple issues that have kind of been brought forward. So one is um, there's a uh, kind of a workflow issue that, that Grimoire Lab is looking to overcome in a move to GitLab um, appears to be able to overcome that workflow issue and it's around issues. So, so far so good. But there's, there's a concern about issues when using GitHub um, and the ability to kind of aggregate and identify those issues in GitHub that GitLab would be able to provide, number one. Um, number two is um, more philosophical so one is the first one's a workflow issue. The second is philosophically about the open sourceness of GitHub versus GitLab. That's number two. Um, and then number three was Chaos's ability to actually contribute to the code base that is GitLab. That was number three. It's kind of tied yeah. in. And so and I think those are the three primary issues. I don't know if somebody captured that in the minutes. Yeah. So. And I, I think I think that last one is the one that has a, like the first two, it's a question of are the switching costs worth the trade off of switching? But this, the third one is, do we have an opportunity to contribute upstream to GitLab in a way that would make chaos metrics visible to GitLab users um, right there in GitLab? Because I think if that's possible, that's that's a game changer, and we should talk seriously about it. So, um, so I don't know if, if anybody, yeah, if any anybody else, Georg, you were on that call, Santi, Daniel, then it thank was thank you so much as well. Okay, um, I, I'm going to look at Ray here for just a second. Um, so, with particular. On that last point, did you understand that last point, Ray? That yeah, yeah, our... and and I mean, I think this even predates me uh, at GitLab and Daniel. You probably had conversations what said about like doing work together, and obviously, I mean, it's my job to encourage people to uh, contribute directly to to GitLab or upstream, if you will. Uh, and then I think there's been prior discussions about like collaborations between. Um, you know, Grimoire Lab folks and 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 GitLab. Um, so, I mean, any, any contribution that you think is appropriate to make to GitLab is obviously, you know, welcome. And then it's absolutely not going to be an issue. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know if there was anything else specific that you wanted to ask about types of contributions that that you want to make or. So um, one of the things that came up was, and I don't, I don't know the scope of, of the open source code base at GitLab, you know, like where mm -hmm. you can make contributions to. So for example, um, making a contribution upstream such that the GitLab API provides um, a particular metric or a particular way of looking at the data, is that within the scope yeah i mean money? yeah i mean that's a good question i mean obviously we have an open core model uh, yeah. we have an enterprise uh, version of gitlab that's i mean the source code is available but this has a pr proprietary license but i mean a lot of our code base is basically you know it's, it's mit base mm -hmm. um and uh uh i mean traditional like open source like a friendly license um 
so it depends on what types of features that you want to contribute to it. If it's a feature that affects the enterprise, and I mean, obviously you can you can still make contributions, but that will be available on a proprietary license. Okay. But if it's a, if it affects a feature that uh, that's part of our community edition, then um, yeah, I mean that's just like contributing to any any traditional okay. like open source software project. So. Okay. And is the is the pull request acceptance rate from for upstream contributions pretty sound? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can, I mean, I feel kind of funny doing this because, uh, I mean, so, I don't want to, I don't want to be like tooting our own horn. We are asking. No, 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 yeah. we're, we're asking yeah. because it's a market, it, yeah. it could potentially, depending on GitHub's yeah. answer to my email. I mean, I think I presented this at the, uh, LF member summit or whatever it used to be called last year. Uh, I think the number has gone down because we hired a lot of people. Uh, the number of community contributions, when I looked at it at some point in 2018, was around 50%. Like if you look at the code that's been merged mm -hmm. uh, into our code base, about 15% came from outside of the company. Um, and oh. the, the number has obviously gone down because we like a triple the, triple the number of engineers. Uh, but let me pull some pages that I can point you guys to. Give me a second. So yeah, Sean, I mean, in the meantime, I don't know if that directly answers your question. Uh, I don't know what the acceptance rate is, um, but um, all the contributions get looked at on a daily basis and they get triaged um, okay. by our bots and a lot of times by me. Uh, so and I'm gonna paste a, a page here. Uh, if you look at the a top portion of that page, it shows you the number of contributors and number of merge requests that have been, we've been getting from, from the wider community. Um, so hopefully that gives you a sense of where things are. All right. What are we looking at here? All right. Okay. I see. Okay. Yeah. And then data is courtesy of our Batersha dashboard. Okay. Another, another part of the conversation we had before, and it's related to this, is perhaps not even contributing upstream, but uh, opening some discussion about having GitLab more research friendly from a chaos point of view. Like, I don't know, uh, I, I don't remember about the specific metrics we cannot have from GitLab, but in GitHub, I remember just to, to bring another example that if you want to have like uh, downloads or number of clones, you need to create kind of a GitHub app that they are requiring. And this is not uh, possible to have to the API directly, as far as I remember. So it's this kind of conversation. So perhaps having certain specific metrics are would be useful for the chaos community. So I don't know how open, so the question would be for GitLab, like how open is GitLab about uh, having these discussions with chaos. And if, 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 uh, if that makes sense to you at all, I don't know. No, no, I mean, I don't like, um, I'm not sure if I understand the, the full details of, of uh, your question, but obviously, I mean, you've probably done this before, like anybody can open issues about, you know, can, can mm -hmm. we like tweak this feature somehow? Uh, and then, uh, I mean, usually it gets triaged by uh, somebody in our productivity team. And uh, I mean, if, if it doesn't get any like immediate attention, you can ping somebody like me, but like somebody from the product team will definitely take a look at that and see, hopefully within a few days comment that, you know, this is, this is gonna break something else so we can't quite do it or like ask clarifying questions. Um, so yeah, I mean, feature requests or questions, um, obviously like, I mean, those issues are, are all, all public. So you're mm -hmm. welcome to open that. At, um, um, the other, I mean, question, I mean, th this is, I guess, sort of stepping back a bit. Uh, you know, I, I don't think I replied to any of the email discussions uh, on the mailing list, but I mean, the question, I mean, this, I think this sort of even came up uh, during the early formation stages of, of, of chaos. Uh, I mean, I, we obviously have like a number of different software communities, right? Um, and, you know, I mean, Gr I mean, Grimoire Lab, I, I think there are, there are, uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, like it might make sense to look at a different alternative. But for other, I mean, I don't know, Sean, like, correct me if I'm wrong. For Sean, I mean, you, you might prefer to have all of your all of your things like still in GitHub. And how do we like, 
reconcile I, that if, if different software communities have different preferences, like I've seen this in other communities and it's a difficult conversation. Um, I'd like us but, to move yeah. together and I'm, I'm open to moving if, if um, the community is behind it. Like I, I won't stand right. in the way. I'm concerned about the switching costs only because I run right. a small team. And yeah. we talked on the call that I'd like to incur those switching costs after the summer instead of have to absorb them while I'm doing Google Summer of Code and a slightly different summer workforce. <laughs> All right. Um, I mean, so, so, I mean, there's another alternative of, I mean, Sean, for example, like your community or your software developers can stay, stay on GitHub because the switching cost is obviously a concern. Uh, some can use something different, but have everything mirrored on, on GitHub so that, like, I mean, there's a place where people can go, like, even if it's like yeah. GitHub. Um, yeah, if the community moves, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna move. I think yeah. I think it's a question of the costs of switching and on the issue stuff. I, I'm looking into it. I I'm, I think I understand what's happening with Paturgy. It's really a question of end user volume and the end users not knowing where to put things and the difficulties that they have managing end user submitted issues that are not correctly classified and also the lack of being able to see all of the issues in one place. And that, that those are two features that can be hacked to some degree in GitHub, which, but which it sounds like GitLab has a better solution for. So if, if the community decides that's worth moving for, um, then I'll get right behind it and make it happen. I just ask it happens after summer. Um, if, GitLab actually lets us make upstream contributions then, then I, and GitHub doesn't, then I think there's a real strategic advantage for the chaos work of making the move, um, just flat out. Yeah, so we had, um, we had talked <clears throat> about uh, trend, if this is gonna happen, right? Um, I'm also of the, it's all or nothing. So it's all repositories or no repositories. I don't think being split is a good idea um developing a transition plan so what would that even look like it doesn't have to be this long extended document but what are the first repositories to move and how do they report back on that move and how do we talk through it um and just kind of the timing of when that transition would occur um and then um and then the other good news i i think it's was it santi you actually have the chaos group is that right Somebody does. I think it was Santi. Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, so I, I mean, think really it's covered in that. That was, believe it or not, another one of my concerns because I had tried to register it and it was taken. <laughs> so I got Chaos One, which that's, that's, just... that's the first thing that I did. So because you right. you never know. No, if you if you send a message to somewhere, maybe there are somewhere that is like, okay, I'm gonna screw these people. So. Yeah. So I mean, I'm glad that that's at least taken care of. The only the one downside is that the user profile of German prey was already taken by somebody who lives in Belgium. So yeah. I don't, I have to. But you mm, okay. I, that's, no. I'm just kidding. I'm just, <laughs> I can contact them and try to get German prey for myself. No, the thing <laughs> is you can, you can, I, I usually log in using the GitHub account. Like the, the, oh, okay. So. so, okay. I think this is a good conversation. Um, maybe we should, in the, just in the interest of time, um, move on. So, um, Georg, do you want to talk about, I'm sorry, did anybody have any last comments on this? I would just in the interest of time. Maybe as a next step, Santi can start sharing access to that chaos group and then we can start looking at GitLab just so as we move the conversation forward, we have a better idea of how we would do the move. Okay. Okay. Um, any other? Comments? I mean, mechanically, I think we would first start by just moving all our stuff over to GitLab and figuring it out while maintaining our primary site on GitHub, and then once what? we've got things worked out, we move everything over to GitLab. Okay. I, will. I mean, like a, on some kind of pilot, like we need some kind of, like I need to do a pilot so I have a better understanding of what GitLab does for us. And Fair enough. Okay. 
And, uh, and I mean, just a quick question. I mean, Santi, uh, were you thinking of doing this in, in the community edition or were you looking at like an enterprise features as well? Well, I, I was I was thinking to use the same thing that we have in Viterja. Oh, okay, so so community edition probably, right? Yeah, well, my, my, my big concern is about the continuous integration because so far we have been using Travis so there are no restrictions with Travis, but in the case of GitLab, uh, it's uh, if we want to do something like that, maybe we run out of time and we will need to buy more time and so on. So especially if Augur also use the continuous integration. So the, that, yeah, that's, the, yeah, go ahead. The, if the GitLab Medium articles I went through last night before I sent my email are accurate, it sounds like GitLab incorporates continuous integration right in the platform, and it's much easier. Yeah, they, they do, but but uh, if you run the the like your test or anything, it, you are using their uh, demos and their stuff, so you have a limited number of minutes that you can use per group. Uh, maybe Ray could work as a deal. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so that, that's 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 the thing. So if if we run run out of time, we will need to pay for to get more minutes. And so th there is a lot of continuous integration on the Chaos Project. The Travis CI jobs I see for Grimoire Lab and Augur are frequent. Yeah. So it's it's the main the main issue in my from my point of view. We, we can also install like a continuous integration daemon that will run all the, a, a worker that can run all that stuff, but we will need to have a server to run that thing. And well, it's, it's more complex. Okay, let's. So, let's but it's, a, it's a probably a different conversation. So, well, it's part of the conversation, but it's not something that we need to figure out if, if we end, if we finally move, okay. we need to consider how we are going to do this. Okay, let's, um, Gare, do you want to, I'm going to, I am going to move on now, just again, in the interest of time. Gare, do you want to talk about succession planning at all? There's a document you have in here. Yeah. So the succession planning is when we engage in conversations about how we continue working in the community in the future, especially as people come and go, which is a normal thing in open source to happen. And I was uh, listening to the, the presentation that Vicky gave at All Things Open on this topic. And her suggestion was to just start talking about succession planning and start documenting what are people doing in the community. And there are many benefits to doing that. Uh, one is to highlight what are the different roles and responsibilities that we have. So someone coming to the community can learn about how they can help, what is possible. It's also as we are all in the community, seeing who is doing what task we can start to talk about maybe sharing the workload or if someone leaves, then we don't have to guess what is it they did. We actually have a document. So that's what the what I think the community handbook is a good tool to use here or to develop into. And so what we did last week on the weekly call is to take that initial list from the mailing list and extended it. And I added it to the community handbook afterwards. So, so is this in the community? Oh yeah, it is, okay. Yep. Yeah, it's yeah. in the community handbook. Gotcha, okay, great. And uh, so moving forward, I would like us to continue just expanding on this and then maybe at some point describe the what are the different tasks which within each of these responsibilities so that we have uh, more detailed step-by-step -step instructions so anyone can follow and we don't lose um, 
lose out if you know core people get hit by a bus mm -hmm. so what are the other so the task is to move these roles forward are there other things in the community handbook that you're looking to advance as well in the community handbook i would also like to document procedures so we have a page about how we organize chaos con uh, I would also like to have one on how we do releases, specifically metric releases. That's where I know how to contribute. Um, I would also like to have some information about how we are organized, how the working groups work, what the relationships are, so that the handbook becomes the central place where someone can go to learn about how the project works and operates and if they want to help, what are the things they can help with. Okay. Um, and I'm guessing- On that organizational level. Okay. And listening to you talk, it, this is kind of, the community handbook is just kind of a s slowly but surely move this forward. Okay. Um, all right, we only have 10 minutes left. So Gary, do you want to talk about the podcast? Yeah, so the podcast as an idea, I know we've talked about this for a long time, or I have at least talked with several of you about this for a long time, is to take what the, all the stories are that we are hearing about how metrics are used in practice and share this out. We have thought about other ways like blog posts in the past, but that seems to not I don't know. I think podcast is the easier format for us. And we can go into the technical details of how we can do the podcast. But just as a, at a high level, it's a complementary service to our metric definitions, where in the metric definitions, we describe what the metrics are, how we can start using them. But then in the podcast, I want to actually tell the stories of how people do use the metrics, what tools they use, how they incorporate it in their workflows, how they do decision making, all those things that are beyond the scope of what we can write into a metric definition. Would you also, in the podcast, think about <coughs> things that we might be missing in the project? You know, like um, the whole goals question metrics you know, are there certain goals? Because right now the working groups, as you know, are organized around goals, questions, metrics, but we obviously don't cover everything, which is fine. So trying to identify those areas of darkness to shed light on. Okay. Yeah, that's another um, good okay. idea. And then one thing that I also hear occasionally is, why don't you have a metric on whatever? Right. My answer is always, well, we haven't gotten to it yet. <laughs> yes. we, we, we have the framework for it. We can start working on this, but we are starting with the low hanging fruits. And so in the podcast, maybe we can start to circulate some of these more complex ideas that would just take us very long to define okay. actual metrics around. That's great. Okay, cool. I put recruiting new people too. <sighs> okay. Great. Um, any questions for Georg, I guess, on the podcast, which somebody had recommended the, calling it the Chaos Cast, which I thought was a very nice name. Um, oh. <laughs> well, Marketing-wise, it might draw a really unusual collection of people. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, succession planning, any thoughts or comments from Georg? That's not me. No, I, I, I got a Google <laughs> voice call, which I don't even know where any, that's coming any from. Any for Georg on the podcast or succession planning? I mean, comes... this might be too much like a detail, uh, Georg. I mean, I, I like the podcast idea or, or broadcasting, uh, you know, a lot of our conversations. Like, I mean, are you, were you thinking of using a specific platform or is, is this like you, you do a Zoom and do a live cast, for example, to make it simple? I am thinking about just using Zoom, recording yeah, okay. our conversation. Right. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about having a panel. So we have a rotating set of chaos members on the panel, at least two, maybe three. 
each uh, time we do a podcast and then we just record it through Zoom. We have one person that we interview um, and then that gets polished, you know, remove all the thinking and gaps, I would create the, um, what are they called, the show notes. And then where we host it, I'm asking the Linux Foundation if we can have this on our website so that we just self-host it. And there's a WordPress plugin that gets it into all the, all the platforms. Do we have a YouTube, like a channel for Chaos? I don't even know. But... We have a Chaos YouTube, yes. Yeah, I mean, we can just even post like a live cast of Dare even, right? I mean, I don't know if like, I mean, editing's nice, but that's a lot of work, right? Like, unless like, you know, it goes, like the recording goes horribly wrong, we can just, you know, like after the recording's done, it gets just automatically posted on YouTube. That's pretty easy. But, but yeah. just for, for thought, yeah. But, yeah, we, we are recording all of these meetings and putting them right. on YouTube, but they're not yeah. a polished podcast format. Yeah, okay, no, I see what you're saying. But... Okay, um, good, thank you. Um, just an update on the DNI badging, I'll be really brief here. So, Georg Ildiko and I have been having meetings with uh, Steve Winslow at the Linux Foundation. So some of you may know Steve. Um, he's helping us through conformance documents. Um, and the idea here would be actually conformance of, as available across all the metrics. This is where we're starting to think right now. Um, so tools or events or projects could label themselves as chaos conformant in the area of risk or chaos conformant in the area of DNI events, or chaos conform, you get the idea. Um, and so building out the necessary legal documents at the moment to actually allow people to um, submit requests for conformance badges, like the DNI badging, um, and then kind of the legalese that goes into it in terms of how um, reviews are done. We're still a ways away from it right now, but just just so you know, we're slowly working through what this might look like um, as structured via help from the Linux Foundation, if we're actually going to do a conformance program. Gary, did you well, want to add anything to that or anybody? I yeah. had something to add to that if yeah, my mic is even on. Um, I, we do, just a reminder, we do have the um, organization on GitHub called Badging. Yes. And we have a, a we're actually Sal and I are working on templates right now to um, if we wanted to add more types of badges, we have templates for submission, um, templates for um, for the pull request template and things like that, that we can build easily build now more badges out of that if we need to, for the future. Yep, I should probably talk with you and Sala whenever you meet next, just to kind of give an update on what Steve has been showing us. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, thank you. Um, we just have a couple minutes left. So um, does anybody want to bring anything that's remaining on this list forward at this point? It sounds like conferences are a little bit up in the air at the moment. Um, I'm working, I'm just, I have not heard back anything just so folks know from the Linux Foundation with respect to Open Source Summit North America in terms of a room. So it's um, very silent. Bogged down by the Corona thing. Yeah, I mean they probably are. So I've I've taken a couple different tacks to get feedbacks. But we, at the moment we don't have a room at all for Open Source Summit North America. So we may want to think about this a little bit with a little bit more urgency because that's coming up in June. If we actually want to do a call for papers, I mean that's it's coming up very very quickly. Um, we are, and then we do have in the last minute here, we already were booked for Open Source Summit uh, or ChaosCon Europe. We have our venue set. So thanks to Tom Menz for setting that out. Um, it's going to be a bigger venue. I think it's going to hold, it can hold nearly twice as many people and it's very fancy looking. So, um, so that's about it. So that's good. All right. Um, if, does anybody have anything? You have a minute or 30 seconds. On the news, the chaos community dashboard now also tracks Twitter data 
And last week, the Sustain podcast released an episode where they interviewed me about the Chaos Project. Yes, I, I met the person who interviewed you today. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, cool. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. Always um, very good to see everybody and very insightful. And I may or may not see some of you in California next week. <laughs> Right, <laughs> depending on apparently a whole variety of factors. So, <laughs> all right, everybody. That's all right. It. Thank See you. Bye. See you.